Hi, everyone. I'm Robin Landau, Director of Programming at Voices of Hope. Um, I am very excited to be here tonight with Stephen Hartov and Oren Schneider. Um, Stephen's book, The Last of the Seven, is a fictionalized account of the little known Secret X Troop, which was a group of Jews who escaped not the Nazis um, and then joined the British Army to exact their revenge. Um, Oren is the author of The Apprentice of Buchenwald, which is a biography about his grandfather's experiences during the Holocaust, both in hiding and in Buchenwald. And although both books tell very different wartime experiences, the protagonists both share courage, resilience, strength, and each find their own ways to resist their enemies. Um, to like to introduce you to our authors. Stephen Hartov was born in New London, Connecticut, and he earned a Bachelor of Fine Arts from Boston University. Uh, in 1973, um, he joined the U.S. Merchant Marine Military Sea Lift Command, and then in 1977 went on to volunteer for the IDF, where he served as a paratrooper and later in special ops. Um, in special ops, I'm sorry, in the branch of Israeli military intelligence. He then served an additional 13 years as an IDF reservist and 17 years as an officer and task force commander in the New York Guard. Thank you for your service. He began his writing career in the 90s with a series of espionage novels based in the Middle East. His trilogy, The Heat of Ramadan, The Nylon Hand of God, and The Devil's Shepherd was nominated for National Book Awards and translated into six foreign languages and a feature film. In 2003, he co-authored the New York Times bestseller In the Company of Heroes, followed by The Night Stalkers, Afghanistan on the Bounce, and the first two books in his new historical fiction about World War II, The Soul of a, Fe of a Thief, excuse me, and The Last of the Seven, which we'll talk about here tonight. He is the former editor-in-chief of the professional military journal Special Operations Report, and his wor works are recommended readings by the U.S. Army War College. Oren was born in Israel. He is a third generation descendant of Holocaust survivors, and he is a seventh generation descendant wow. of farmers from the Galilee. He is an entrepreneur, currently the CEO of Circa. He enjoys music, cooking, travel, people, and especially the combination of all four. He uh, received an MBA in finance and entrepreneurship from Columbia Business School in 2006 after completing an LLB and a BA in law and economics from Tel Aviv University in 2002. The Apprentice of Buchenwald is his first book and it beautifully honors his grandfather, Alexander, and he dedicates it to brave people everywhere who chose not to give up. Um, at the end of the program, there will be time for questions. Please put any questions you have um, in the chat to me and I will get to them later. So um, I'd like to start by um, hearing a little bit about each of your books. If, um, if you could each tell us a little bit about what your books are about and why you decided to write them. And Oren, we're going to start with you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. It's also a pleasure to get to know Stephen. I, I think that we're going to spend some time together. We, we both spend time with in special operations of the IDF. I'm, I'm sure we're going to we're going to share some stories. Um, so this this book has been in the making uh, for almost 50 years. I lost my father, who was an Air Force pilot at a very, very young age. Um, and my grandfather, the camp survivor, stepped in um, to a father's and educator's role. Um, he started sharing his Holocaust memories with me at a very, very young age. Um, and I started recording it. 
uh, recording him at a very young age as well. Um, he was an international businessman. He used to travel abroad to Japan in the 60s and 70s. He used to bring back all these analog recording devices. And I started using them to capture these memories later on. Um, I've improved my uh, technical capabilities and used better, better devices to capture his mother's uh, recollections and his memories. Um, the book itself um, starts by describing um, the life of the Rosenbergs, uh, Austro-Hungarians uh, who lived in Czechoslovakia in, in the 1930s, um, liberal democracy, a multi-ethnic um, environment where Jews, Christians, Roma live together, um, um, a happy life, um, an affluent family that was uh, beginning to experience um, the, the frog in the boiling pot of water um, uh, decade where where Jews started seeing all these signs and train stations calling them to leave the country, uh, where their businesses uh, were taken away, um, where they had to um, start going after favors from, from Gentiles, um, from, from Christians to, to, to try and, and save their lives or, or, uh, or keep themselves alive long enough uh, to avoid deportation to the camps. Um, so the story goes, um, follows the Rosenberg family through those years. Uh, the father Solomon um, was a very successful businessman with a specialty department store in their small town. Think of a small uh, burg of Goodman or, um, or a Harrods or a KDV that sells everything from a fancy Scandinavian smoked fish to very nice French uh, leatherware. Um, the mayor is the best customer, he never pays. When then 1942 comes, and when you need to, to protect yourself, that mayor steps, uh, steps up and um, issues that um, elusive white certificate that allows him to uh, designate a Jewish family uh, critical for local economy and allows it to, to stay alive for a few more months. Uh, later on, the family goes underground to escape the Gestapo, uh, lives under an assumed identity, escapes to the capital, Bratislava. Um, an unfortunate turn of events uh, leads a Jewish informer um, um, to, to basically bring the Gestapo uh, to their door and father and son are, are, are sent to Buchenwald. Uh, mother, mother's fate is unknown until the end of the war. Um, and during their time in camp, um, a very unique situation um, develops where um, their life is saved by a non-military head of the um, uh, military um, manufacturing facilities in Buchenwald. Um, he becomes very, very close with Alex, my grandfather, and gives him a very, very sensitive um, position in the factory, uh, being the runner. That factory produces uh, the Mauser 98, the main rifle used by the Wehrmacht. Um, he trusts him, and Alex develops a relationship with Soviet POWs, French POWs, and basically becomes a central um, part of an elaborate sabotage scheme uh, to damage um, the German uh, the German guns. Uh, the most dangerous thing for for Jews and non-Jews during that time in the factory are, is not the Germans or the Nazis, uh, is the Allies uh, and their bombings until that factory gets bombed. Um, his father is um, is injured gravely and. Now Alexander needs to, to be very, very smart about uh, managing to find his father, save his father, and he's, he's able to save both of them. They live through liberation uh, and they find um, mother back in Bratislava after the war. Um, that's a story I've lived over my life. Thank you so much. And it is an amazing story. Um, Stephen, can you, uh, Tell us a bit about, about your book. Sure, and I want to thank everybody also for being here. And it is uh, a surprise and a pleasure to meet Oren. We do have a lot of things in common. The first thing I noticed when I was reading his wonderful book is that our families have very similar backgrounds. My grandfather, who was from, uh, and my mother, of course, were from a small town outside Vienna. They also had a, a private concern a very large home and the bottom part of the house was a general store sounds very similar um they were not they, they were sort of secular jews you know they were jewish but they blended in they assimilated and uh when the war started kristallnacht started 
Uh, they lost everything eventually, and most of the family went to the camps. But my grandfather and my grandmother and my mother uh, were able to escape and come to the States. So I was raised, and, and, my, and my mother's brother as well. He came here first on a farmer's visa. He was 16, and as soon as he was old enough, he joined the American Army and went back to fight in Europe. Um, so I grew up around all those sorts of stories. And the, when I got into uh, historical fiction about World War II, the first story that I had been wanting to write for decades was based on my mother's great uncle, Alexander. And he was a Mischling. I don't know if you all know what that is, but it's a mix, half Christian, half Jew. He was partially Polish, partially Austrian. And Uncle Alex decided that the best way to hide from the Nazis was to join the Luftwaffe. So he went into the German Air Force and where he hid in a Luftwaffe unit, he was able to hide for about 13 months. Obviously he wasn't circumcised or they would have discovered him at the first shower. And he was turned in by his young Polish Catholic wife. And they sent him to a concentration camp, which he survived. So that was the impetus for my first book in this series, The Soul of a Thief, which is about also a, a young Austrian Mischling who's serving at the behest of a German SS colonel in France right before the Normandy invasion. And these two characters are in love with the same French Jewish girl. So at the end of that book, as I was writing that book, as sometimes happens with writers, these seven characters appeared and uh, they were uh, German and Austrian and Alsatian Jews in British uh, in the in the British Army, but wearing German uniforms. And that came to me because I knew that to be a true story. Um, that uh, these orphan boys in the early part of World War II, many of whom had escaped to what was then Palestine, had joined the British Army, and because of their skills in German uh, and in German culture they became bandos for the British army in North Africa and they wore Nazi uniforms and that's how they infiltrated behind German lines. And I knew a few of these elder gentlemen when I was a young Israeli paratrooper, I met them and they had always, their stories had always enthralled me. And so my second book, which is a bigger novel, uh, The Last of the Seven, is about one of these young men who survives some terrible events in, in the war in North Africa and goes on uh, to become uh, a British commando functioning in uh, German guise along with a number of other men. And um, I don't want to tell you the whole story, but that's what that is based upon. And it's based upon um, a whole series of, of true facts. Um, so it's a, it's a part of our of our history, uh, certainly that not that many people know, but that was all true. And these fellows were very brave young men. Um, Stephen, when you talk about um, the book about your uncle, um, are there any um, characters or anybody in um, The Last of the Seven who are are based upon your personal experiences or family members? Yes. Um, the chief chief among them is my uncle, Leo Lefkowitz, who uh, is the major elder character in the central part of the book, which takes place in an American field hospital in Sicily. And my uncle, Leo, who was all American and he was a tough Brooklyn doctor uh, joined the American army and went over to, to be a combat surgeon. And so that character is, that character is based completely on him. He was exactly the way I describe him. I remember him vividly. He was a tough cigar smoking country doctor. And, um, he won the bronze star at the battle of the bulge. He was wow. a tough guy. Yeah. Wow. He's, he's an amazing character in the book too. Wow. He has such a presence and it's amazing that that was, that was your uncle. Yeah. Um, Oren, um, 
so you, you, you've you talked about growing up with um, your grandfather um, and these experiences. How do, do you feel um, your family's Holocaust experiences have influenced who you are um, and what paths you've taken? Um, I think that hearing Stephen and also speaking um, during our last conversation, I think that growing up in Israel is somewhat different than growing up in the US when it comes to Holocaust, Holocaust remembrance. Um, there's a very deep Holocaust indoctrination in Israel uh, that is part of becoming, uh, becoming an Israeli, rite of passage, uh, going to the army. Um, the state had decided many decades ago um, to sort of mandate uh, these trips to the camps in Poland uh, as, as part of um, the process of melding uh, young souls and, and sort of um, teaching them, explaining to them why um, the, the state of Israel came to be and, and what is our role as, as soldiers and, and protectors of the Jewish people. Um, my grandfather took a, a very different path. Um, he's, a, he's a quintessential survivor um, who focuses life around optimism and the love of life. Uh, for him, uh, the fact that he's alive every day and is actually able to go back to Germany and go back to Austria and, uh, and, and be served uh, by locals in the culture of his choice and the language of his choice, that gave him the most pleasure. Uh, the fact that he can go back um, proudly with his offspring, uh, enjoying the best this rich country can offer, really was his uh, reason to be in, in the years um, after moving to Israel. Again, in I mean, they, they boarded a ship in 1948 um, as young survivors, they, they disembarked in the port of Jaffa. They were giving guns and they went to, to fight the war of independence in Israel after uh, just a few years after being um, liberated from camps. Um, my grandmother went through a similarly traumatic experience. So they never, they never experienced high school. They never experienced the years of university. They had a very, very different life. Uh, so they had to... They had to rediscover uh, reason, reasons for living. And for him, it was showing and demonstrating uh, his survival and his happiness and his uh, positive nature. And he gave it to all of us. That's sort of, that's his legacy. There's a scene in the book where you go back to Germany with your grandfather and you talk about um, how your grandfather was always very well dressed and wore, you know, a suit, and, and you were there with your a, a typical teenager, and you went into the uh, the bank, and he presented himself. Um, so when you talk about your grandfather as having this this optimism. There, there's this element in the book where you, the, the banker says, why are you, what brings you to Germany? And you, as the grandson says, well, my, my, he was a Holocaust survivor and we came to, to see. So um, I'm just curious about, about that tension there and how, um, and how you both experienced those types of things, how your grandfather went in one way and how as his um, child, or his grandson, you went in a, li a little differently. I'm just curious about that. Wow, I, I never thought about that this way. First, you made, you made me sort of think about him. He would be very upset with me showing up to this wonderful event without a suit and a tie. He would be... <laughs> Ah. He would be personally offended and very upset with me. So my apologies um, to him. Um, he, he managed somehow in 1945 to, to create complete separation between all of his experiences as a Czechoslovakian child um, and a survivor um, before the war and being this 
Israeli, um, young Israeli person who's fighting for the survival of, of, of a new country and building himself up, up, up from scratch. Um, he, he really didn't want any of these memories to resurface in his new life. He felt very comfortable on a Friday afternoon when everything winds down um, in Netanya in Israel and we're lying in his big bed to tell me everything that he went through, but that was sort of our, our space where we would talk about it. Uh, when, he would, when he would go out to his life, he wanted nothing to do with it. He, I mean, it wasn't that he was traumatized, that he couldn't deal with it. He would come and visit um, my school every Holocaust Remembrance Day. I remember him in third grade, like telling all the kids all these stories and their eyes popping out. And he, he was very happy to talk about it but he almost looked at it as a, as a different person in a different life. That was his way of, of dealing with it. And when I sort of made it a point at that visit in the bank in Frankfurt to mention to his banker that one of his favorite clients is a Holocaust survivor. I mean, the guy, I mean, became colorless and, and couldn't breathe. And, and he was very upset with me. Uh, that sort of mixing and mingling these these two lives was something that he was he wasn't about to do and he didn't he never wanted to do, uh, but again it, it never created tension he he always he was always able to move forward and just say let's let's not spend time on this this poor guy what I mean they they went through enough I don't need to to add more to their to their issues like we went through and had our issues they had their issues what do you know about his family about his grandparents about his parents wow. Wow, that's um, that's amazing. Um, in in both your books, they you tell very different stories, very different experiences. Um, but both Alex and I forgive me if I'm pronouncing this wrong. Freilich, who's the main character in Stephen's book, they sh they both share this this incredible courage. I mean this this courage and a very quick wittedness, right? They both are very quick on their feet. They know how to respond. They know how to react. And, I, and I'm curious, and we'll start with you, Stephen, um, if, and also curious about your, your grandfather as well, but do you, are these characteristics that you think were innate in, um, in your case, or in, in, your, in your grandfather and in Stephen in these, amazing men who took part in this commando secret commando unit or did the commando start with the commando unit did they find people who had you know did they find people who had those characteristics and then um led them to the unit or did these people kind of rise up to meet whatever challenges they faced. First of all, I just want to say something that's funny that you mentioned that scene from Oren's book that I loved as well, where he they go into the bank and he mentions that we're here to visit Buchenwald <laughs> and the banker goes pale, which reminded me of my mom. She would do the opposite. She was a young girl when she came from Vienna. And I went back with her to Vienna maybe 10 times. And every time we were there, she would make sure to remind some Viennese that she was thrown out of the country and lost her home because I think she loved to see them embarrassed. I, it was a different, it's just a, it, you know, she, that was her victory was saying, <laughs> I'm here, I'm alive. You weren't able to kill me. So it's just, it was really wonderful it, to read the section of, of uh, Oren's book. Right. And while you bring that up, before we get to the innate characteristics, then, because this is another thing in Oren's book that I that I found really interesting, was your grandfather had this um, this warm, accepting, you know, look, they don't know what they you don't know what they've been through. They, you know, it was their parent. You don't know. Be kind to them. Um, and his mother. So you're a great grandmother. There's another scene in the book, which I found to be very chilling, where she um, talks to her friends, who people who she thought were her dear friends following the war. Um, yeah. 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 And I, I thought that was really interesting that people had the, 
that she had the opportunity to do that and that she did it so well and so strongly. So why don't we, you tell a little bit about that and then we'll get back to the other question. Sure, so very, very briefly. Um, my great grandmother, Irene, uh, was a true fashionista, very stylish. She lived the, the grand like German culture life in the 1920s and 1930s. And she made, I mean, she was secular and she wanted to assimilate. And her friends were the wife of the Protestant pre, uh, um, uh, priest. And uh, I mean, she was, she, she had this very international living room where they played bridge and smoked. And I mean, friendships were everything for her. Um, and all of a sudden when, when they needed to give away the furniture and the jewelry. And when these friends, I mean, appeared very happy to take away all of her jewels and treasures, I mean, she, I mean, she broke. And she went through Ravensbrück and her camp and she made it out alive after producing missiles for Siemens and um, nearing death numerous times. But when she made it back alive and they had a chance to travel back um, to Kosice near their, near her hometown, she would never go back to her hometown. She didn't want to set eyes on her house, on her empty house or visit her friend's house with all her treasures. She called them to visit her in Kosice just to see them one last time and let them know that she will never see them again. And that, I mean, that she, she thought that they had a friendship, but that there was no excuse for what had happened in the late 30s and, and early 40s between them. And again, I won't give more details, but she would never go back to Europe, unlike her son, who took me and other grandkids and, and enjoyed Europe, she would never go back to Europe. She was invited to all sorts of ceremonies in Germany, et cetera. She passed away at a very uh, old age, 102. And she she had incredible memory and, and she knew a lot and she shared a lot with us, but she would never go back. She didn't want to see any of it, any of that world. Thank you. Um, all right, so we're gonna, pivot and get back to the question uh, for Stephen. Stephen, did they handpick these people to serve in this commando, secret commando um, group? Yes. 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 Okay. Much, so like, much like assessment and selection is today, even in the IDF, when I was in, when Oren was in, for elite units, they, you didn't just show up and say, I, I'd like to do this. You, in the case of the special interrogation group, uh, which was this small unit of, of um, European Jews who were serving as British commandos, but in German uniforms, they were the toughest of the tough. They were all orphans. They had nothing to lose. Um, they had to demonstrate their capabilities just in terms of character before they would be accepted into a unit like this. The unit was so secret, it wasn't uh, declassified until many years after the war by the British. And I'll give you an example of how brave they were. There was an order issued by Hitler called the Kommandobefehl, which stated that any uh, allied troop, not in his own uniform, any commando would be executed immediately, and they knew it. So they were not only they had a double whammy against them. They were serving as commandos against the Africa Corps, and they were Jews. So they knew if they were caught, they were dead. And uh, I just want to tell one really quick story. Their commanders were two um, Brits, Bertie Buck and David Russell, who each spoke five or six languages and dead fluent German. And to prove to their commanders that these young Jewish boys could uh, pass as German troops. They went behind German lines, the two officers with three of the Jewish kids, all in German uniform. They walked into a German army camp. The three young uh, commandos got on the paymaster's line with their forged German pay books to collect pay for the day. And the two officers, Bertie Buck and David Russell, went into the officers' mess and sat down and had lunch with German officers. And then the three of them, the, the three boys and the two officers left, snuck back through British lines, and Bertie Buck went back to his commanders and said, I think this proves to you that my people are tough. 
so that's how that's how tough they were. Wow, that's yeah. And Orin, growing up, did you know any of these stories? Did you had had you because this isn't so, these this isn't something that um, is well known. As you said, it was um, classified for many years by um, Britain, but I don't think it's a widely known part of the story in the United States. Or, and is that something that was known in Israel? Was, was that part of the- yeah, gr Yes, Gro growing up in Israel, you're, I mean, part of, of the old stories about the 30s and 40s, Palmach, Agana, Etzelechi, Machlaka Germanit, what, what Stephen was describing. These are all the, the myths, not myths, the legends uh, of bravery um, the generations of, of warriors, fighters uh, are, are being taught, and um, these stories are so inspirational. Many, many of them uh, are untold, many of them will never be told, but the ones that are told, um, I think that they're, they're definitely shared with um, intelligence officers, warriors in these units. They're all very, very aware of, of the history of these hmm. units. Hmm. Um, so... Freilich and, and, and these men in the X troop had, you know, the greatest opportunity for, um, for um, fighting against the Nazis. They could actually go and physically fight against the Nazis. But there were so many different instances of resistance um, amongst the, um, amongst uh, uh, other uh, Jews in Europe. And um, a big part of your book is talks about what your grandfather did in Buchenwald. Um, and could you tell a little bit about because about his um, sabotage of the armament of the arms that he was working with? Yes, I, I think that there's a there's a fundamental difference between soldiers and civilians. Um, Correct. Especially in 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 times of war, um, soldiers uh, need to fight. Uh, civilians can choose can choose to fight. Um, I think that the one of the things that hit me as a young boy listening or hearing the stories, I would ask my grandfather. Um, obviously, you're you're detached from from the outside world, and you're you're a forced laborer, you're a slave. But you understand that the Germans are about to lose, um, or it's highly likely that it's now 1944. Uh, you're hearing stories about Soviets uh, coming from from the east, allies invading Normandy. Why would you risk your life? Um, and and we, we we used to have these discussions. And he said, "Look, I, I was 17. Um, I'm not sure I thought this through." Uh, to the extent that you're you're asking this of me now, but if but if I had to if I had to think back, um, obviously we all wanted to survive, and there's a unique relationship that's developed with a with the manager of the factory that's very close to Alex and his father. Um, this whole Stockholm syndrome, sort of betraying the trust of that manager, um, but it's it's sort of. He knew that he was risking his life and his father's life by participating in the sabotage activities, but he needed a purpose and survival in itself was was probably not enough. And and he sort of he found his purpose by teaming up with non-Jews, um, with with fellow humans who were sort of teaming up, coming from different backgrounds, Soviets and French and Danes um, and Dutch homosexuals and criminals that are all sort of tied and um, and are operating in that in that factory and they're they're joining forces uh, to fight the Germans in the only way that they could which is changing the way that um, parts of the rifles are being constructed putting all sorts of pins in a furnace to weaken them uh, over pressuring screws in the guns and again doing it in a in a smart scalable and consistent way that that allows them to damage um, a, a wide array of guns in a way that cannot be detected in the factory can only be uh, sort of identified during battle um, when it's already too late and um, and way later um, so again he finds himself in a in a very unique situation for a 17 year old Jew um, and again the fact that he's very very good with his hands he has a great technical sense 
Um, he's he's interned with a with a with an old Jewish locksmith in his old town when his school shut down and his father wanted him to uh, to have a profession. He interned in Bratislava as a um, as a typewriter apprentice, which again also serves him later uh, in the book. Um, but a very unique situation for a seventeen year old. Well, it is really interesting that what gave him the background to learn some of the skills that he needed, which which helped sabotage, the, which he helped use to sabotage were because he was forced to leave school at such an early age. Um, but you, you, it's you talk the about- It's the technical uh, issues. And the, the, the other thing is he spoke seven languages. And part of the part of the reason he was able to be so effective is the Germans separated the Soviets, they separated the French, they had different shifts, they made sure that no one spoke to anyone. If you put a, a unit of Soviet like team members or army members along the same operational line of building a rifle, it would be sabotaged in 15 minutes. But they mm -hmm. couldn't communicate. And 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 sort of they were all separated they couldn't speak to each other and all of a sudden a slovak kid comes there he speaks perfect german and he speaks russian and he speaks czech and he's able to communicate with people that speak 15 different languages in the factory so he becomes very very important because of who he is at 17. right um there you you talk about his purpose um and and becoming a saboteur as part of his purpose, but he had another very big purpose, which was he promised um, his mother that he would take care of his father. And it did strike me in reading both of these books at how young, at how young um, Alex was during this, you said he was 17 and Stephen uh, Freilich was uh, during this experience. And um, rather than his, father taking care of him he was was charged with taking care of his father and there's just a couple of things that he does that are I'm guessing very very dangerous and uh that it does that protects his dad if you could just talk about the chocolate bar for instance which is which is great and then we're going to get back to Stephen. yes so uh again without without giving away uh all of the plot the father is gravely injured uh, by the Allied bombing that completely destroyed the factory. He's he's being taken back to the main uh, camp at Buchenwald, whereas Alex is is joining the uh, the bomb squad to help um, um, take away all the bombs that did not explode. Uh, miraculously, he's identified as um, as an as a typewriter apprentice. And again, if if we think of internet as vital today. The, the German army, the Wehrmacht and the Gestapo were run by typewriters. If they don't have typewriters, they cannot issue orders. They cannot uh, send them around, nothing happens. And sort of he, he finds himself in front of 500 broken Mercedes uh, typewriters and he starts fixing them. So the, uh, the operation around Buchenwald can, can be restored. And he builds the trust of his captors and he's being left alone in this long wooden shack with a with a locked door but as a as, as a technical wizard uh, with experience with a, with that Jewish locksmith he he builds this um um jimmy key very easily and breaks into that um um that bunk that that behind that door and he finds a treasure of um in, Red Cross shipments to all these POWs that were confiscated by the Germans, and he finds more chocolate that he could never dream about, uh, and he over, overnight becomes the richest person in Buchenwald, uh, having all these tangible assets uh, that are the best currency in in a place where no money exists, and he sort of uses his Nestle chocolate bars uh, to bribe his way into finding his father, and eventually he's able to nurse him uh, back into health. Uh, when the Americans, uh, the Third Army, the Sixth Division, liberate uh, in 1945. Thank you. Um, Stephen, um, well, in, in both of your books, I'm, I'm, Israel plays a very central role in, in each of the stories. And um, 
I'm curious about your personal relationships with Israel. Um, Stephen, when you, it was 19, was it 1977 that you just decided to join the IDF? I'm curious if um, any of that decision was based upon some of your family history um, and, and if that played into it at all. I think all of it was based on that. I mean, um, I um, when I joined the Merchant Marine, I was halfway through college and I decided that I needed to see Israel, but I had no way to get there because we were not a, a moneyed family. So I sailed all over the world until I wound up in Israel. I was there for the Yom Kippur War. Then I came back. I finished college. And right after that, I went back to Israel to join the army. But I think that motivation was driven by the family Holocaust history. I had grown up, um, you know, as a Jewish kid in Connecticut with a family history that was sort of steep in, I don't want to say victimhood, but, you know, uh, we had lost most of the family in the Holocaust. My, my grandfather and my grandmother and my mother and my uncle were here and happy, but I sort of was drawn to this new kind of image of Jews and Judaism, which really was awakened in me during the Six Day War. I was 14. And it so enthralled me that I sort of knew even at that age that I was going to wind up, I wanted to be one of them. I wanted to be one of these tough Israelis. And so by the time 1977 came around, I was I just chose the toughest thing I could do there and join the paratroopers. Uh, I had no idea what I was getting into. I mean, it was like joining the Foreign Legion. I spoke Hebrew, but as Oren will tell you, Army Hebrew and Street Hebrew are two totally different things, especially for a chocolate American. So, yeah. But I was definitely driven by my family history and by World War II, which is also why I think I'm constantly drawn back to that experience, even in my writing. Right. Um, Oren, was your in your experience in the IDF, do you think that was shaped at all by your family history? It's a good question. I mean, it's very, very difficult to separate the family history or my family history from uh, for who I am or who I've become, especially because my grandfather plays such a such a key role. But growing up um, in Israel, everyone went to the army and they all had uh, different stories and different reasons. They all ended up in different places in the army. Some became fighters, other became clerks, um, but everyone served. It's a little different today. Um, also, we're, we're farther removed from um, independence, Holocaust, et cetera. So it's a little different. Uh, but growing up, um, it was definitely a, a big part of it. Um, following October 7th and, and, and what we're experiencing in the world now, um, do you, for both of you, do uh, you feel that you're books play a different role than you think that you had originally intended or thought that they would? Lauren? Um, part of the reason I wrote this particular book beyond um, my duty to my grandfather was um, that I, I thought that younger, younger people knew less um, about the Holocaust than they needed to. Um, whether it was the curriculum or the fact that um, uh, parents stopped talking to them about it. Uh, so part of the purpose and the reason the book is written the way it is, is because I, I really wanted younger, uh, younger adults and younger people to read it. Um, when, I, when I spoke at schools, I purposely tried to separate current events um, from Holocaust. Uh, and from discussing the Holocaust, because I, I felt that um, tainting the Holocaust um, with controversy that has to do with policy, government, and other things that are important and 
on everyone's minds is is not helpful and not useful for our discussion about the Holocaust. And I'm I'm trying purposely to separate those. Um, even speaking at schools, I, I happily engage in discussions about um, the modern Middle East, uh, the events of the, the past 75 years, uh, the establishment of Israel, um, separately than um, my discussion in, in my seminars that, that focus on the Holocaust and the reasons for the Holocaust and the learning from the, of the Holocaust. And I, and, and I think I managed to do that. Um, and I will try to continue doing that in the future as well. Thank you. Stephen, what about, what about you? Well, I wrote some questions from the audience as well. I wrote these two books prior to the events of October 7th, but my books are very clearly, when you read this series of historical fiction novels, they're, they're written to honor the people who participated in these events and in, during the war. And, you know, I, I don't write about war as much as I write about people who happen to be in environments where there is a conflict. It's not, I'm not a action war writer, so, so to speak. It's, it's really about the relationships and so forth. And since October 7th, I, in, in these appearances, of course the subject is brought up. And we do discuss that uh, you know, with readers, I discussed with readers my feelings about um, what has happened recently and how it does relate, not so much to the Holocaust per se, but unfortunately to the Jewish experience across the ages. And so we're all experiencing something now that we probably didn't think we would see and um, in our lifetimes, especially those of us like myself and Oren who have some sort of Holocaust background and have at least, at least I have held the, um, held on to the hope that these sorts of things would not occur again in terms of anti-Semitism and, and, you know, anti-Zionism and all this stuff, but here we are. So we have to deal with it in, in the environments in which we find ourselves. And we often find ourselves in uncomfortable environments talking about it but I don't hesitate to talk about it. Uh, my older son, uh, whose name is Oren, uh, right the day after October 7th, picked himself up from his flat in LA and went right back to fight. So these things don't go away. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Marina. Um, and she asks, she says, when both authors were writing their stories, how did how did you research the non-personal parts of the tales? Were there certain resources that you relied on or uh, felt really painted the picture well, um, especially if it was something little known as the case of Stephen's story? So um, Stephen, we'll start with you and then. Uh, my research is usually personal, unless it's a specific historical event that I have to, you know, get into a book about or consult with multiple sources or try to talk to people who are still alive and survived. I generally don't write about any place I haven't been to. So I always go to the places that I'm going to write about so I can feel it and smell it and so forth. And, um, you know, the historical aspects, you have to dig sometimes. And in The Last of the Seven, I had to dig pretty deeply. But in The Soul of a Thief, it was family history. It wasn't that difficult in terms of research. Okay. Um, Oren, your your book is, is nonfiction. Um, and you write it in um, the first person of your, most of it, in the first person of your of your grandfather, um, how did you, what kind of research was involved? What, what was your process like? So I had many, many hours of recordings of him and his mother, uh, which were the foundation of the story. I obviously um, visited uh, all these locations with him while he was still alive a number of times in Slovakia and in Germany. Um, the, the one additional X factor that was extremely helpful, um, was genealogical, uh, research that I've done, um, 
on a platform that a, a friend of mine from the IDF started uh, called My Heritage uh, 15 years ago. Um, that was sort of one of his first clients um, and sort of he helped me sort of think about uh, databases and sources of, of information in Europe. And when the first DNA tests came out, um, I used them to effectively connect with family members, Rosenbergs, who left the old town before, way before the war. That we were, I was aware of their existence. I didn't know their names or where they were. They're all in the States, um, which also allowed me to connect to family members who all look like us, but um, I never knew who they were. Um, they're everywhere here in the country. And so we managed to get amazing materials and letters and um, many, many things that allowed me to learn more about my great, great grandparents in that town, sort of how it all started, connect a few dots um, and sort of make, put the, the final touches on the story. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, and I'm curious from, from, from both of you, if when writing, uh, Stephen, when writing Freilich's story and Oren when writing your grandfather's story um, and through growing up with your grandfather, of course, have you internalized any of your grandfather's and Stephen, any of Freilich's traits or outlooks on life? <laughs> Do you want me to take it or I'll take it? Please. Um, I write fiction, so I'm, I'm um, when I'm not writing nonfiction, I write fiction, and I'm pretty much of the mind that all the characters the fiction author writes are him or herself in one way or another. So it's not so much that you internalize or absorb the traits of your characters, it's they do that from you. So of course, Froelich is uh, a combination of myself and, and people I served with. And in many ways, except for my uncle Leo Lefkowitz, they're all sort of mixtures of people that, you know, that I create rather than the other way around. Right, thank you. And Orrin, what about, what about you? As you because... mentioned it, it's all, it's all written in the first person. So my level of, identification with the story of solidarity is complete. I felt as if I was the one living um, the life that he had lived and sort of he lived it through me as a young child, as a person that he was trying to, to raise, to be strong, uh, to be resilient. Um, so yeah, he created a, a lineage of highly optimistic people uh, that will forever tell his tales and his stories of survival um, and the love of the good life. And there's a beautiful part in your book when your daughter quotes your grandfather back to you, which, which I really loved as well. So thank you. As we wrap up, it's, it's, um, it's been wonderful to, to speak with you both. Thank you both so much. And, um, Thank you to the Jewish Book Council uh, in helping us with our programs and also to Evelyn and Mark Schechtman for supporting the program um, and for everyone in the audience for joining us and for your questions. So if you haven't read these books, they're phenomenal and um, they are available for you. I see them going into the link right now. So uh, please um, take the time to read both of these books. Um, they're, they're really incredible. Thank you. Um, and uh, we also hope that our next program is on uh, April 4th at Bethel Temple. We're going to be doing a program with the Bethel Brotherhood and the Jewish Historical Society. Um, we will be joined by Mark Schmidick, who will be sharing his parents' um, survival story um, and the crazy fateful events that, that brought them together. Um, there's information about this and all of our upcoming programming on our website, which is also in the link. link. Um, so please be sure to take a look at that, to visit us on social media. Um, and finally, if you enjoyed tonight's program and you would like to help us provide 
more educational programming for the community. We hope you will consider supporting Voices of Hope using the link in the chat. Um, Oren and Stephen, it was really a pleasure to meet you both. Thank you so much. Um, and everybody enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs>